Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. A LaSalle College student parked his car off Susquehanna Road and began to hike across a vacant lot in the drizzling rain. The unnamed young man, various newspaper reports put his age between 18 and 26, was a peeping Tom and was en route to spy on the inmates of the nearby Good Shepherd home, a Catholic residence for wayward girls. But what he found as he walked across the overgrown lot that night would destroy any interest that he had in looking in young girls' windows. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode… A young girl is serenaded by a ghostly boy. Strange and terrifying things begin to happen after two children play with a Ouija board in a 200-year-old house that used to be a funeral home. Is it possible that Dracula wasn't a vampire after all? California diners flock to an establishment for good food, good wine, and good spirits, especially the ghostly kind of spirits. But first, once, Cropsey was just an urban legend, the boogeyman of Staten Island, but now he is real. We begin there. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness. This is the story of a nightmare come to life. Once, Cropsey was just an urban legend, the boogeyman of Staten Island in New York City. Cropsey was rumored to be a homicidal madman, an escaped mental patient with a hook for a hand who hunted children and dragged them back to the abandoned ruins of the old Seaview Hospital, a former tuberculosis sanitarium. Parents would use the legend of Cropsey to warn their children to be good. Older siblings would tell Cropsey stories at night to terrify their younger brothers and sisters. But then, in the 1970s, Cropsey came to life in the form of an actual homicidal madman who really did hunt children. His name was Andre Rand. Rand worked as a janitor at the Willowbrook State School on Staten Island, a place whose name alone can and should frighten both children and adults. It was an institution for mentally disabled children. In 1972, it was revealed to be a living hell. The young Geraldo Rivera made his name that year in an expose that revealed the horrific conditions inside and ignited a national scandal. Willowbrook State School was closed in 1987. In that same year, Rand was arrested in connection with the disappearance of a 12-year-old girl with Down syndrome, Jennifer Schweiger. Thanks to the loss of his job, Rand was homeless and living in a makeshift campsite on the grounds of the abandoned school, not far from the abandoned Seaview Hospital so closely tied to the Cropsey legend. Searchers found Jennifer's body in a shallow grave on the desolate school grounds. Rand was charged with murder. Rand had a record of crimes against children, 
1969, Rand was arrested after attempting to rape a child. And in 1983, he kidnapped a bus full of children, even if only for an afternoon. And by this time, police already suspected him in the disappearances of at least four other Staten Islanders going back more than a decade. Alice Pereira, five, who disappeared in 1972. Holly Ann Hughes, seven, who disappeared in 1981. 11-year-old Tyhees Jackson, who disappeared in 1983, and Hank Ferrio, 22 and mentally disabled, last seen with Rand at a diner in 1984. None of the bodies were ever discovered. Rand was eventually convicted of kidnapping Jennifer Schweiger, but there was not enough physical evidence to make a murder charge stick. Though he was the prime suspect in four other disappearances, there were no bodies and so no concrete evidence there either. Rand was sentenced to 25 years in prison for the Schweiger kidnapping. He would have been eligible for parole in 2008, but in 2004 police found new evidence in the Holly Ann Hughes case. Rand was convicted on a second kidnapping charge and given a second 25-year sentence. He will not be eligible for parole until 2037 when he will be 93 years old. Dracula. Dracula did, in fact, exist. However, he was not a bloodthirsty vampire, but a prince in Wallachia, a part in present-day southern Romania. His real name was Vlad III, but he was often called Dracula. Romania is full of ancient tales of the supernatural and legends of the unexplained, and these stories have long influenced our imagination. It is very likely that the Irish author Bram Stoker borrowed Vlad's name for his Transylvanian count in the book Dracula from 1897. We have to remember that Dracula is literally translated in Gaelic as Dracula, which means bad blood. Vlad lived between 1431 and 1476 and is regarded a national hero in his home country. He was considered a brutal and yet fair ruler. During the 15th century, there was a struggle to obtain control of Wallachia, a region of the Balkans or Romania which lay directly between the two powerful forces of Hungary and the Ottoman Empire. The power of the Ottomans seemed unstoppable. Vlad used severe methods to restore order in a lawless state. He also had the courage to drive the occupation force, the Ottomans, out of the country. But Vlad had a dark side, too. He was delighted in torture and executions. He was famous for slowly driving a pole through the body of his enemies while they were still alive. Vlad was a very cruel man, and his methods were brutal. Impalement was and is one of the most gruesome ways of dying. It often took hours, and in some cases even days, before the poor victim died on the pole. Later, the pole and the victim's body were put on public display. This horrifying sight was meant to serve as a warning to all Ottomans as well as different types of criminals like thieves, murderers, and others. Dracula was feared by his enemies, and he was given the nickname Tepes, meaning the Impaler. The origin of the name Dracula has not yet been entirely confirmed. Drac means devil in the Romanian language, and the ending, Iula, means son of. We can assume that Vlad's nickname was Son of the Devil. Still, we must not forget another very important aspect related to the origin of Vlad's name. In 1431, Vlad's father was a member of the Order of the Dragon, a secret order of knights meant to protect the royal family from the invading Ottoman Turks. The dragon was considered a symbol of the devil. Therefore, Vlad's name can simply mean Son of the Dragon or Son of the Devil. It is unknown why Bram Stoker used the name Dracula in his book, but there are two theories. In 1890, Stoker borrowed the book An Account on the Principalities of Wallachia and Moldavia 
which was written back in 1820 by William Wilkinson. This book contained many descriptions of Dracula's life. Perhaps Stoker used this book as a source and inspiration for his novel. Another possibility is that Stoker learned about Dracula through his friend Professor Arminus Vanbury, who he visited on several occasions in Budapest. Stoker mixed the history of Dracula's life with folktales of vampires, and it resulted in a classical book which is still popular today. Dracula was a cruel, ruthless, and bloodthirsty ruler, but he was not a vampire. In Romania, he is considered a national symbol of fight for independence against Ottomans. There, he is a hero. When I was a child, my father and I lived in an old clapboard house with my aunt, her husband, and three children. One day it was raining very hard. I went out of the porch just watching the rain. As I was watching the rain, I became aware of a boy in an old abandoned house next door. This boy was watching me and seemed to know who I was because he started singing the old song, I Dream of Jeannie with the Light Brown Hair, but he substituted my name for Jeannie's. His name was Alan. Turns out that Alan lived not very far from my aunt's house with his many brothers. We became fast friends. My father, after a time, purchased a gas station. This gas station had an attachment house to it. We moved from my aunt's house to the gas station. My mother and father were separated, they patched things up, and she moved in with us. Every day, Alan would come over and profess his love for me with wild flowers or candy. I just ignored these professions of love. I was 11 years old. What did I know of love? Then one day, Alan just stopped coming over. I really didn't think much of this. I had plenty of things to occupy my time, like driving my father's truck around town. Yes, I started driving at nine, or swimming in the Suwannee River and various ponds around the area. The gas station was also a general store. Every night at closing, I would help my dad with counting the money from the register, stocking shelves, etc. The station was set in between a fork in the road with the main road coming right towards the station. One night, my dad and I are counting the register and we see a car approaching down the main road. As the car approaches, one of the headlights goes out. My dad says, looks like someone may have hit a deer. When you're traveling down this road, you can either take a left at the road that goes to the swamp, the Okefenokee Swamp, or go left or right by the station on the fork. The car makes the left turn on the swamp road. When it does, there is a horrible scraping noise. The car stops dead, then backs up. When it backed up to mine and my dad's horror, a mangled blue bicycle falls off the front of the car. My dad turns to me and me to my dad, and in unison we say, Oh my God, he's killed one of the Mercer boys! Why we would both say the same thing at the same time To this day, I have no idea. The Mercer family did not have much money. There were four boys in that family. They all shared the use of this one bicycle. As soon as the statement was made about the killing, my father took action and I followed. He jumped in his truck and he went to the accident site. As we got there, we knew the man who had hit the bicycle. He was leaning on his car, sobbing like a baby. He was just saying, I didn't see him, I didn't see him. My father had a friend named Chuck who lived not very far from us down the swamp road. My dad says to me to go get Chuck. I might add that there was not a body or an injured person to be found. I ran down the road as fast as my feet would carry me, banging on Chuck's door, screaming for him to come help as quick as he could. Chuck and I ran back to where the car was. That's when the search for whoever was hurt began. The Suwannee River ran down both of the sides of the highway. There are huge embankments there and also a bridge. These embankments we had to search. We searched and searched. We did not find anyone. Then over an area that had been searched many times that night, Chuck yells out in the dark that he found him. He'd stumbled over him. To my horror, the him was Alan. It was plain that he was dead. By this time, the family had already been called. 
The state trooper was the first to arrive, and when the ambulance got there, for the family's sake, he stated, he's alive, let's get him in the ambulance. Sadly, Allen was not alive. His skull was crushed. To this day, I do not know how we missed his body on that search. It just was not there, and then all of a sudden it was. Allen was pronounced DOA once they arrived at the hospital. That, I might add, was 30 miles away. He just didn't stand a chance. After the pronouncement of death, my father and I went home. After a while, I went out to the dark station to get a Coke. I guess I was in shock. I had no emotion over the accident yet. I go out into the station to get my drink. The station had two huge picture windows at front. Well, someone had parked the car that was involved in the accident right in front of this window. The hood had blood all over it, with a big dent where Alan's head made an impact. I lost it. As the days went on, back in those days, the body would be brought to the family's house for viewing. The first day of the viewing, I walked to the Mercer house, got there fine. His mother was so overwrought. I felt so bad for her, and also my own pain. While I was there, she started to tell the story of what happened that night. Her story was that, yes, she had brought Alan to the river to go fishing with her. Once there, he asked her if he could come to our house and to the store. His mother, knowing the history of him stealing from my father, she asked him if he had any money. He stated that he did not, and she told him that he could not come without money. She stated that she continued to fish, and before she knew it, he was up on his bike and gone. While he was gone, she heard a terrible crash. In her heart, she knew it was her son, Alan. She even called out, Alan, Alan, Then she heard his voice say, I'm fine, Mama, so she thought nothing more about it. Of course, at this point, he was already hit by the car, injured or dead. The hospital had sent home his bloody clothes in a brown shopping bag. She showed me these clothes, and they were unwashed, bloody, and they stank. I almost got sick to my stomach, made my excuses, and headed home. To walk home, I had to go down that dirt road that was at least a mile long or longer in the middle of the woods. As I was walking, I felt that someone was watching me. I was hearing noises in the woods following me. At one point, I turned around and there he stood, in the clothes I had just seen in that bag, a red and black flannel shirt and a pair of blue jeans. He just stood there and didn't say a word. He was transparent like particles that you could see through. It scared me so bad I ran all the way home as quick as my feet could carry me. I did not tell anyone, not my mother, my dad, or friends. After Alan died about three years later, we moved to Mayport, Florida. We lived in a trailer park. Our trailer had an outside light that had a short in it. It'd blink on and off. You'd simply go out and jiggle it, and it would stop blinking. One night, my parents went out to dinner. A friend of mine with the same name, Sheila, agreed to stay with me while my parents went out. While we were playing around, listening to music, the outside porch light began to flicker. I opened the door and reached up and started to jiggle the bulb, and there he was. Alan was standing right under the light in those same red flannel shirt and blue jeans. I was in shock could not say a word. I could not talk. I could not move. Then I heard my father's truck pull in, and that broke my silence. I began to scream. I ran to my dad's truck, screaming and crying. My dad is like, what in the world did I just do wrong? And I said, oh my God, Dad, I just saw Alan. My dad answered, yes, I have seen him also. And then I heard it, almost like a whisper, a dream of genie the long brown hair. I've recently listened to a podcast you were on about the black-eyed children and how you had only read two stories about individuals letting them in. My family had an experience recently that lasted years, and I really would like to get it out. The story is indeed long, where it was over a few years, but I'll give you the summary of it. 
My brother has always talked about the white and black man, but we just always assumed something was not right or it was just him growing and having a large imagination. Well, long story short, my brother and cousin played with a Ouija board in my grandparents' 200-plus-year-old house, previously a funeral home. When I listened to the podcast and you speaking, I got chills and actually had tears in my eyes because it helped explain everything. My brother is currently 15 years old and will be 16 in July. A few years ago, he told us he was outside playing basketball and a little girl asked him if she could watch him. Being a kid, he said yes. Things began to change then. He would always say she would stand in the corner of his bedroom watching him and in the bathroom. I personally always felt weird in the bathroom. I actually would shower with the curtain open, and I'm 21. He couldn't sleep very well, and still can't, but he used to go outside at night just to relax and the swings would always swing. Not just a calm wind-pushing swing, but a person-is-on-them type of swinging. Nothing violent came from it. She would just move things and basically try to play. In my grandparents' home, they have a picture of the old owners, and there's a little girl in it, so we assumed it was her. Again, she was friendly, so we just thought she was lonely. Well, she would do things like move his stuffed animals around all the time in places to be dumb for someone to put them, like under the bed or hidden in his closet when they originally sat on his dresser, not even close to the better closet. This is what shocked me about the story, the white and black adults, because this is what confused us about his case, how the adults found him. Again, he was outside playing basketball with the girl watching and a black man appeared, asked if he could come inside, and my brother let him in. Drew was at the age of maturing, so his emotions were everywhere, but he was mean 24-7 now, yelling, cussing, not wanting to be around anyone. Drew told us about this man, but again, we just thought something was wrong mentally until his friend said he saw him too. The girl was now gone, and it was just the man. The man always came at 3 a.m. when no one was expecting him. If you wanted to see him, he wouldn't show. Drew and his friend said, you get sick, very cold, and you're not able to move, and then he shows up. The guy got violent, throwing my brother's phone and even grabbing him. My mom one day even took a rosary up to his room, she's not religious, and started saying it and it broke in her hands. My little sister, eight years old, would say she had seen a guy standing in my mom's room at the door and actually drew a picture that looked like the hat man. My brother hated life and hated everyone in it. My mom let him have friends over, probably six or seven of them one night, and my brother began to sleepwalk. He'd never done this until these things were in his life, so his friends decided to follow. He walked probably a mile down our road in the dead of night, stopped and yelled, run, they're coming, and took off sprinting back to my house. He stopped at the end of our driveway and said, it's okay now, Debbie's here, and walked back into our house and placed his shoes at my door. I was away at college, so my room was empty besides the bed, dresser, and a few personal items as well as a Bible, which belonged to my grandmother who had recently passed away. Debbie was in all white when he saw her and was instantly relieved, which really shook me when you talk about the white adults searching to get the black. My family lived in fear for a few years because of Drew's experiences. More than what I just said had happened. My sister has woke up mid-sleep and told my mom she smelled vanilla and my mom has smelled very sour since. Drew's friend woke up one night and was cooking and said he'd seen the black man standing at my mom's door. I one night stayed up waiting to see him. My cousin Drew and his friend were sleeping with me in the living room. I stayed up until 3.05 and then went into my mom's room because nothing happened. I heard my phone go off but ignored it until the next day. It was my cousin, and he texted saying he's at the door staring at me. So many things have happened, and this is just the shortened story of it. I think coming out with this will help him and help my family altogether. 
Drew's attitude shifted completely as soon as this happened. He hated life, couldn't sleep, and was all in all generally terrified. High on a cliff in San Mateo, near Half Moon Bay, a restaurant called the Moss Beach Distillery sits overlooking the ocean. It is a very popular restaurant, and diners flock to the establishment for good food, good wine and spirits, especially the ghostly kind of spirits. You see, although the establishment has a fascinating history all its own, it is most famous for one of the most notable unsolved mysteries in California. This is the story about the Blue Lady Ghost. Moss Beach Distillery dates back to 1927 when Frank Torres built the restaurant bar. He named it Frank's Place and turned it into a speakeasy, a place that illicitly sold alcohol during the Prohibition era. It was frequented by some very influential people of the times, and it was a place for a variety of underground criminal activities. Politicians, gangsters, and silent film stars ranked among Frank's clientele. This proved very advantageous to Frank. You see, Frank's place was used as a drop spot for Canadian rum runners. They landed on the beach below, hoisted the rum up the cliff, where it was loaded into vehicles for delivery to other illegal establishments up and down the coast. Frank's connections provided protection for the operation, and his nightclub was never raided even though others in the area were not so fortunate. But rum was not the only spirit in Frank's place. The restaurant is rumored to be haunted by the Blue Lady Ghost. Supposedly she is the spirit of Mary Ellen, a beautiful woman who loved to wear blue dresses. The Blue Lady story goes that around 70 years ago, Mary Ellen, a married woman with a young son, fell in love with a piano man, John Cantina. John and Mary Ellen carried on an illicit love affair for quite some time. They would rendezvous at a hotel right next door to the Moss Beach Distillery and take romantic walks on the beach below during their passionate encounters. The affair ended when Mary Ellen was tragically killed. There are conflicting stories regarding the way in which she died. One account says that someone attacked her while out on a walk with John at night. She was stabbed repeatedly and John was also attacked but survived. Another story goes that Mary's jealous husband found out about the affair and took up a fight with John in which Mary was stabbed. Subsequently, John disappeared and then washed up dead on the beach. The second account of Mary's death reports that she died in a car accident during a bad storm. To add to the drama, John was supposedly having an affair with another woman at the same time as Mary. This woman, Anna Philbrick, jumped off the cliffs and drowned after she discovered John was involved with another woman. Parapsychologists indicate that such emotionally charged tragedies often lead to hauntings. This seems to be the case at the Moss Beach Distillery. Some of the reported activity attributed to the Blue Lady Ghost include objects moving on their own, whispered voices and taps on the shoulder when people are alone. A couple who once owned the place said they were locked out of their rooms on several occasions, and furniture would inexplicably move around. Some female patrons have claimed that their earrings disappeared. Those earrings would later reappear along with a bunch of others that had been previously reported missing. There are a large number of stories from children who say they have seen the lady in the blue dress. One really crazy story that employees tell has to do with the computerized cash register. For reasons that no one, including the computer tech, could explain, all the dates in the system changed to 1927, the year Frank built the place. Other employees claim to have heard her whispers, been physically touched by the spirit, or called via cell phone. A few years ago, a popular paranormal show conducted an investigation at the Moss Beach Distillery they discovered many contrived paranormal effects that were the work of the most recent owner. It appears that the restaurant intentionally plays up the hauntings to create a dining experience somewhat like a Disneyland attraction. Although this has cast some doubt with the skeptical, many personal stories still abound. 
the number of people who have had strange experiences lend for a very intriguing, if not convincing, narration. Who could resist a Shakespearean tale of tragic love affairs, broken hearts, murder, suicide, and ghosts? Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. All stories in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find source links or links to the authors in the show notes. The Ghost of Alan was submitted to Weird Darkness by Sheila Pugh. My Brother's Strange Visitors was submitted to MyHauntedLife2.com by Carly. Dracula, Not a Vampire? posted at AncientPages.com. The Blue Lady of the Moss Beach Distillery was written by Jim Hunt. And Cropsy Comes to Life was posted at the lineup. Again, you can find links to all of these stories in the show notes. Weird Darkness is a production and trademark of Marler House Productions. Copyright Weird Darkness. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Proverbs 11, verse 25. A generous man will prosper. He who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. And a final thought from six-year-old Nika. If you want to learn to love better, you should start with the friend who you hate. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. Imagine waking up one morning and when you look at your friends or loved ones, you see their ears, noses, and mouths stretched back with deep grooves on their foreheads, cheeks, and chins. All the people you know have suddenly turned into hideous, demonic creatures, and it's not even remotely close to Halloween. That's what one Tennessee man is experiencing right now. I talk about him in this week's Mind of Marlar, which you can find at mindofmarlar.com.